Hi, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, we'll be starting. We'll be starting momentarily. Right. Thank you, everyone. Um, and hello. Um, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to the Tufts Latin American Committee's uh, first live conversation of our speaker series titled Decision 2021, Elections in Latin America. My name is Mateo Hernandez Hidro, and I am this year's vice president. Here at LAC, we seek to dissect and scrutinize current events and issues in Latin America. Our mission is centered around creating spaces like these that engage both the Tufts community and the general public to keep the conversation about the region alive. 2021 will prove to be a year of massive structural change in Latin America, with nine elections being hosted throughout the continent, five of which will be presidential. This massive influx of political change and continu continuity, democratic contestation and electoral participation will undoubtedly impact the next decade of Latin American politics. That's it. Thank you for joining us today for the inaugural conversation of this speaker series, where we will explore the region's elections with our invited expert. For this conversation, we will focus on three countries, Peru, Ecuador, and Brazil. Ecuador and Peru went through elections two weeks ago, and their top candidates represented opposing views. We will analyze what factors came into play for their successes, how their campaigns have echoed the needs of the people, and try to notice regional trends towards certain policies, policies or politicians. In the case of Brazil, a country with heavy influence in the region, we will try to infer what the 2022 elections will look like given the current state of the country and its leaders' notorious controversies. With us today is Brian Winter, a journalist and expert in this field. Mr. Winter, is the editor-in-chief of America's Quarterly and the vice president for policy at America Society and Council of the Americas. Winter spent a decade living in Latin America as a journalist for Reuters, based in Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and Mexico City. Since 2015, he has been based in New York City. His writings include The Accidental President of Brazil, the story of Brazil's former president, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and No Lost Causes, with ex-Colombian president, Alvaro Uribe. Winter has been featured in TV, radio, and print media, from NPR and the Wall Street Journal to Latin American media. Thank you for your presence today, Mr. Winter. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mateo, for having me and for that introduction. And I, I appreciate the invitation and admire all of you for being here on a, a Friday afternoon, which I know is always hard, and a, and a beautiful Friday afternoon, too. So thank you for spending some time with us. It is also my honor and pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Patrick Bellard, who's the president of LAC. Um, Patrick, whenever you're ready, uh, you can take it away. 
Thanks, Mother. I'm glad it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure. It's an honor and pleasure for me too to be here. Um, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, and thanks to Brian, thank you so much again uh, for, for kind of separating time from your day, from this beautiful day, as you say, uh, to speak with us a little bit. Um, you know, before we dive into the questions, just two quick comments. Um, if the audience does have any questions and there is a Q&A function, feel free to submit them through there and then uh, we'll hopefully get to them by the end of this. Uh, and then I guess the second is the second thing is that, uh, Brian, if you could kind of give us a bit of a primer on, on what we'll be discussing today and a bit of your background, then that would be great. And we'll dive to the questions and we'll dive into the questions afterwards. All right, Patrick, that sounds great. Um, well, thanks again for the opportunity. And just to briefly tell you a little bit about myself and, and why a, a gringo from Texas is here to talk to you today about Latin America. Um, uh, my story with Latin America really began right after I graduated undergrad from the University of Texas at Austin um, back in uh, February of 2000. Um, six weeks after graduation, I bought myself a one-way ticket to Buenos Aires with kind of a big dream of becoming uh, eventually a journalist, but I thought at the time I would just be going to speak English for a while. And I ended up walking into uh, the beginnings of one of the biggest economic meltdowns of the last 80 years. Um, which is, you know, hit Argentina between 2001 and 2002. And that did turn into an internship and then a job with Reuters. Uh, I ended up covering that whole crisis that saw five presidents in two weeks and a huge currency devaluation and big debt default and unemployment that was upwards of 30%. And it was in, in many ways, it was my, my baptism by fire and kind of journalism as well as Latin America. And, um, it ended up turning into uh, a career. And I've been following Latin American politics for the last 20 years. Uh, half of that time I spent living in the region, uh, the time in Buenos Aires, which I already mentioned, I did one year in Mexico City. And then uh, most recently I was based in Sao Paulo in Brazil from 2010 to, 20, or from 2010 to 2015. Um, since then I've been here in, in New York. Um, I am a political analyst who follows Latin America and I also edit a publication about the region called America's Quarterly, which I, I hope you're I hope you're familiar with. Um, and you know, as we look at the region today, gosh, uh, things are really tough. Um, twenty twenty was a very difficult year. Uh, Latin America has eight percent of the world's population, but it had twenty eight percent of the world's um, confirmed COVID nineteen related deaths last year. It was also with the Eurozone, the part of the world that suffered the most economic damage. Uh, unemployment has spiked, hunger, um, schools have been closed in far greater numbers than any other region in the world. And unfortunately, you know, now that we're into 2021, and I, I, I frankly, just on a personal note, I remind myself of this all the time. For most of us who are here in the United States, things have gotten better this year. Um, you know, the, the, the death, uh, the caseloads are down, the pandemic has receded somewhat, although it hasn't totally disappeared. And we're making really extraordinary progress in terms of vaccines, um, as well as the economic recovery. Um, and so if you're an American, you know, things seem better this year. But for most Latin Americans, they're not. Um, even in the countries where vaccination has been relatively uh, ahead of the curve, and I'm thinking of Chile and Uruguay and a couple other places, um, cases have continued to go up and, and those countries are still in sort of different stages of lockdown. And, you know, lockdown really more severe than we've generally seen here in the US. I and mean, Chile people are really not leaving their apartments. Uh, and that's that's true in some other cases as well. So things things remain really tough. And that's, you know, people are, are <clears throat> tired, they're sick, They've lost loved ones, um, and they are really angry at their governments uh, almost across the board. And that's really kind of the, the broader context for some of these specific elections that we're going to talk about today. So um, Patrick, with that, again, very short intro, uh, I kind of hand things over back to you. Thank you, uh, Brian. Yes, I mean, everything you've kind of touched upon, we'll hopefully get to discuss a bit more, um, you know, as the questions continue to unravel. Uh, just a couple of comments. The way we're going to approach it is kind of through, through a case study basis. We'll be looking at the Brazilian elections that are happening next year uh, in October 2022, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, and then we'll take a look at Ecuador's elections, which happened earlier this month, and the Peruvian elections, which are in the process uh, and will be finalizing in June. Um, right, so I guess we'll just, we'll just dive straight into it. First of all, uh, concerning the Brazilian elections, attention is on the possible polarization between Bolsonaro and Lula in the 2022 elections in Brazil. Various observers worry about the prospect of a deeply polarized campaign in 2022 that will contaminate the political environment for coming months and could eliminate the space for other candidacies. Now, it is worth noting that although Lula has not formally confirmed his candidacy, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a recent poll conducted by um, IPEC or IPEC uh, determined that the former president leads Bolsonaro by, by 12 points in terms of popularity, which I guess is just something interesting to take into consideration. So, Brian, the question is, you know, you're one of the analytical figures who has expressed a bit of skepticism for this uh, polarization. So I was wondering if you could explain your reasoning for skepticism on the effects of, you know, this polarization between Bolsonaro and Lula in the 2022 elections and its impact. Yeah, no, these are a great question to start. Um, I can tell you guys are following Brazil really closely, just kind of by the way that that was that was phrased. Um, look, I have expressed skepticism on Twitter and elsewhere that we would end up with a, you know, very polarized Lula versus Bolsonaro election. I am less skeptical than I was maybe a month and a half ago, meaning that uh, with each passing day, it seems more likely to me that we're going to end up with that Lula versus Bolsonaro race. And I have to say, I mean, the word polarization, it gets used a lot in today's politics. And sometimes it is a negative thing. And sometimes it's not anything to really be afraid of, meaning polarization can mean people with different ideas and kind of different visions for what the future of Brazil is going to be. And I think that's clearly the case with these two candidates. Um, and I'll, I'll come back a little bit to kind of what they are, are standing for and sort of their tactics. But to first just touch a little bit on the Brazilian context and kind of what's been happening over the last couple of months. Um, really, I mean, the general intro that I gave regarding Latin America as a whole, those things hold very true in Brazil. Um, this P1 variant, the so-called Manaus variant that was first located or first spotted in Brazil has just wreaked havoc this year and in, in kind of really heartbreaking ways after, you know, it was already a difficult year in terms of the number of deaths last year. Um, it's been awful to watch, you know, scenes of hospitals running out of oxygen and kind of lines out the door of hospitals. And the federal government, the Bolsonaro government, has it received a lot of blame for that. And a lot of it is justified. Uh, Bolsonaro um, echoing in many cases the rhetoric that was coming out of uh, Washington from his self-described idol, uh, his word, his idol, Donald Trump, um, you know, really spent the initial months of the pandemic using very similar language, talking about how it was just a little flu, um, touting hydroxychloroquine as uh, a quote unquote miracle cure, even though it, its effects were not proven, um, which is kind of a diplomatic way of describing, you know, um, the effects of that, that medication. Um, and not really mobilizing Brazil's resources for vaccines in the kind of energetic way that he could have. And again, I, I'm, maybe I'm being too diplomatic with my language. I mean, Brazil is a country that has a long history of being advanced on vaccines. Uh, and it kind of frittered that away over the period of several months because, again, you had a president who, for various reasons, was determined not to take it um, seriously. Now, this was attenuated somewhat by, and this will sound contradictory, but you know, sometimes, especially in these big countries, you can have multiple stories going on. Um, Brazil also had on an economic side, the most rigorous kind of support given to the most vulnerable amount uh, members of society uh, to help them through the, um, the pandemic. I say the most, the, the most vigorous in Latin America uh, Brazil gave monthly payments for most of 2020 of about $100, $115 per month to some of these very vulnerable sectors of society. And, um, you know, that may not sound to a layman like much, but uh, in a place like Brazil, for people who are sort of part of the most socioeconomically vulnerable portions of society, 
it was actually a game changer. I mean, it really helped a lot of people get through the pandemic um, in a much better way than they would have otherwise. And as a matter of fact, uh, nationally, because they were giving out this aid, the percentage of people living in extreme poverty actually fell um, compared to prior to the pandemic. So this was a big deal. It kind of helped sustain Bolsonaro's approval ratings for a while, even as COVID was spreading like wildfire through society and, and causing a lot of you know, healthcare hardship. People economically felt okay about what was happening. It also helped support the broader economy in Brazil. Uh, Brazil's economy amongst the big ones was the economy that suffered the least destructive recession last year. It only shrank about four point something percent. Um, so, so, you know, those, that was something that, that was able to sustain Bolsonaro's approval ratings for a while. But now sitting here in April, 2021, I mean, the problem is you can't, a country like Brazil that is, has its a fiscal accounts under pressure, even in the best of times, um, they weren't able to afford those programs forever. And so that aid has now been substantially reduced and surprise, surprise, uh, Bolsonaro's approval ratings are now spiraling downward again. Um, into the breach then back in March stepped Lula. And, you know, I, 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 I'm happy to sort of go into more detail about Lula's past. I don't know how people, how acquainted people are with who he is, but this is a guy who's been a central figure. Maybe I would argue the central figure in Brazilian politics going all the way back to 1980. I mean, he's really been kind of the protagonist, um, uh, going back now 40 plus years. And he was somewhat unexpectedly allowed to become a candidate. He had been um, briefly, uh, he was jailed for about a year on corruption charges, but those corruption charges were overturned um, by first by a, one Supreme Court judge and then by kind of the, the court as a whole. And the bottom line is that now to the surprise of some, um, it looks like Lula is going to be able to be a candidate next year. And, and Patrick, you know, I, I, I do think he will run. In fact, I mean, I'm pretty certain that he will run. And it looks like it's going to be, um, I mean, I think it's safe to say Lula is a slight favorite at this point. I don't, I don't know that he's a, a slam dunk to win. And there's a lot of time between now and next October, but he's, he's looking strong. And I, I you know, given the Bolsonaro still maintains 25 to 30 percent of society is still kind of with him no matter what. And Lula has about the equivalent. And, you know, maybe there's still a path for some kind of third party candidate who, who might be more in the center, but it looks very narrow. And some of the candidates who they thought might step into that space have kind of gone, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, they just see that there's so much energy with both of these um, candidates that that some of these figures appear to be sort of backing off and either pursuing other positions or not getting involved in politics at all. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you you lay it brilliantly, you know, kind of explaining the whole scenario of what we're going into in 2022 and how, you know, this past year and, and the pandemic has influenced um, kind of Bolsonaro's I guess, chances of getting elected. Um, you know, and, and something that you mentioned, obviously, consistently in the pandemic uh, kind of pre presents a brilliant segue for kind of the next question that we wanted to ask you, which correlates the pandemic with uh, Bolsonaro's breed of populism. Um, now, a little bit on, on, I guess, for our audience, uh, on Bolsonaro's response to the pandemic, you know, it's been met with a lot of criticism due to his inability to curtail the threat it poses to Brazil, you know, uh, his response is mostly characterized by indifference, I guess. It's not even a matter of, you know, it's, it's a failure to acknowledge to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, responses to the crisis have been slow. So I guess the question is, how is his handling of the pandemic a direct manifestation of his populism and his, I guess his brand of populism? Yeah, no, it's a good question. You know, populism is kind of a word that I, I maybe I'm sort of quibbling here, but that I, I tend to avoid because I, I find that it gets misused a lot in the political space. It, it's kind of one of those words that people use to describe, I'm not suggesting you're doing this, but people use to describe somebody who they don't agree with. 
I mean, I, I think that in Bolsonaro's case, the more accurate, I think he's clearly he's nationalist, but he also, he, he, he subscribes to, he calls it sort of an anti-globalist, socially conservative school of thought that, um, you know, is very influenced by Donald Trump, uh, specifically, specifically by Steve Bannon, uh, who has many interlocutors in positions of power in Brazil, including the president's son, who they apparently, um, I mean, they, I know for a fact they've, they've, talked, regu- they've talked, they've spoken regularly over the years. Um, you know, to be fair and to sort of try to paint all kind of sides of this for you, I mean, the way that Bolsonaro has cast this argument since, I mean, look, he was clearly denialist um, and has been consistently denialist at intervals uh, since the pandemic started. There's no way you can erase kind of those things that he said. What he would say if he was here <laughs> is that he has also um, stood up for people's quote unquote right to work and earn a living for them, for their families in a country where there's often very little margin between like day-to-day existence and starvation, right? I mean, I, I you know, People, most people in Brazil live on a very tenuous income and uh, to not be able to go outside their homes and work for even a couple of days puts them in a very difficult situation very quickly. So, you know, Bolsonaro has, I, I think somewhat cynically, but also somewhat sincerely presented himself as sort of the defender, as the guy who's gonna stand up against your governor, your mayor who wants to do lockdowns and keep you inside and, and and then you know he has said some things in defense of that that I personally find reprehensible. Um, just my own opinion, you know, things like um, uh, we're all going to die one, we're all going to die someday. Um, yes, people have died. Uh, I'm sorry. What do you want me to do? I mean, just some very kind of you know attempts to kind of wash his hands. So I think you know I think some of it is clearly uh, worldview. I think some of it is also listening to some of the wrong people. And, and I think some of it, again, to be fair, I think some of it is a recognition that um, while things like mask wearing, the efficacy of that is not, not open for debate, um, the efficacy of lockdowns uh, is open to debate. And he has positioned himself as very anti-lockdown. Um, because they say he says they do more harm than good and I, I you know so that's that's kind of where he's been but what, what's undeniable as we sit here now and again in, in April 2021 is the public's opinion of his handling of the pandemic is is at the floor I mean uh, whatever goodwill was generated by this emergency aid program that he started is 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 gone now and he's really suffering a lot of political pressure as a result one just 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 one one note on that the day lula was allowed back in the race was sort of officially authorized to, you know to where he had his corruption conviction overturned it became clear that he was probably going to be a candidate again bolsonaro shows up for a press conference with a mask on which was not something that he had done much of. And it wasn't the first time, but it was definitely, everybody kind of went, ah, like he realizes that he's under pressure now. And there've been some other moves that he's made since then that clearly, you know, are kind of in a defensive posture, preparing for, you know, a very strong election challenge next year that he didn't expect when the year began. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember that vividly. I think it was like March 8th or the week of March 8th that it was it was kind of a, a turnaround where, um, yeah, he was kind of wearing his mask and it was like, oh, OK, I guess <laughs> this the, he feels the pressure, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, another area where, where uh, you know, Bolsonaro has has, I guess, received a little bit of controversy. Uh, is in the climate change sphere specifically, especially, you know, given his kind of vast territory in Brazil and and his role in in protecting the Amazon. You know, many international leaders have criticized his administration's inability to take uh, climate crises in Brazil seriously. Um, You know, many have said that his recent speech at the climate summit, which, uh, yeah, was was more cognizant of the crisis, but um, he apparently has failed to still put his words, in, words into action. So, you know, could his inability to deal with the climate crisis negatively impact his election chances? 
Yeah, it's a great question and, and one that's kind of playing out before our eyes right now, uh, you know, with this big speech that he gave yesterday at the Climate Summit. Look, I mean, there's no question that Bolsonaro spent the first two plus years of his presidency and frankly, his entire career before that, dismissing man-made climate change as a problem, um, taking specific actions that undermined what had been a, success, a Brazilian success story over the last 25, well, really 20 years in terms of reducing uh, deforestation levels. Um, the deforestation levels had started to rise again prior to his presidency, but they've dramatically gone up. They're up 40 percent um, since he took office uh, on New Year's Day in 2019. Um, and, you know, this is a guy who also, for part of his political support base in Congress, has, you know, the so-called grilleros and, and, you know, kind of illegal loggers and others as, as part of his support base. So I I think it's perfectly fair to um, be skeptical of him now that he has kind of changed his tune somewhat. And, you know, his, his speech yesterday did surprise a lot of people with its tone, um, as well as some of the specifics. I was speaking to um, a former U.S. diplomat just earlier today who told me that his reaction while listening to the speech was one of astonishment. He was like, who is this guy? It doesn't even sound like the same Bolsonaro. Uh, and apparently there was even some technical language that was in there that was virtually identical to what um, the Workers' Party governments on the left had been saying uh, 10 years ago. And so, you know, it really does show a, um, a change in tone. But look, I mean, the fair question is, so what? So what, you gave a speech, so what? And um, that is, for all the reasons I cited, a very fair and I think necessary question. And the, the answer really is, is now Brazil has to show um, positive progress in terms of reducing deforestation levels in 2021. Uh, they laid out some goals yesterday for 2030. Um, it's, it's not gonna be enough uh, because for two reasons. I mean, one, because I think we all know the urgency of climate change and we know that this government in the United States is attuned to that. But also, you know, the, the, the diplomats and specifically John Kerry, you know, the former Secretary of State, who's Biden's climate envoy, they are very attuned to the possibility that um, Brazil is just uh, bullshitting, to use the technical term. And um, so they want to make sure that there's, you know, real progress in 2021. And so they're going to be watching very closely. And I, as far as the question about the impact on the election, I, it's tough to say. I don't think it ultimately impacts many votes because this has not been a big domestic issue in Brazil. And as a matter of fact, um, there's been polling over the years that suggests that Brazilians mostly approve, or, or better put, it's actually one of Bolsonaro's best issues in polls is his handling of the environment because people kind of see it as an us versus them thing. Um, but it does make a big difference in certain quarters and particularly the business establishment in Brazil, which is very anti-deforestation because they realize that it poses a risk to their bottom lines. Basically they fear, you know, whether you're a Brazilian bank or I think in a lot of cases with the agribusiness companies, they realize that, you know, this whole deforestation thing, this whole Amazon question and having Leo DiCaprio and others kind of tweeting about you all the time it's bad for business because it affects your reputation. It makes people not want to buy your product and it makes Brazil kind of a toxic brand in the world. Um, so, you know, part of the reason why Bolsonaro is changing his tack on this is because of pressure from the business sector specifically, whose support he need, you know, he was, he had back in 2018 when he got elected and who he needs again in 2022. Right. Well, I, yeah, this is all incredible and extremely interesting. And I, I guess we could just talk about this the rest of the conversation. But uh, considering that we do have a couple of other elections to get to, uh, we could move on to the Ecuadorian election. Um, and I'll give the parole to Madeo. I don't know if you want to go ahead and ask some questions on, on Ecuador. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Brian, as, as we were discussing earlier, right? Um, Ecuador is just, just uh, a very peculiar case, um, you know, having uh, the first round of elections in February, uh, where it was the, um, where, where the second place was very contested and there was uh, a lot of controversy on whether a candidate Guillermo Lasso um, 
it could have, uh, you know, like actually passed uh, to the second round and it was contested by the, by the third runner, um, Jakub Perez and by many other blocks. Um, and then finalizing in, in, in April and actually having Guillermo Lasso uh, beat the, the, the Correista candidate, uh, Andres Arauz, who was a, a former uh, culture minister and central bank director, you know, representing the ex-presidents Rafael Correa legacy uh, of leftist policies in Ecuador um, and, and who, who at least uh, to my eyes was very against, against many odds uh, Guillermo Lasso was able to beat in a very narrow, uh, you know, by a very narrow difference to uh, beat, beat Andres Arauz. Um, so my first question would be, um, you know, Lasso's chances of winning were slim. Uh, again, in the first round, uh, he was the second runner by 13, by a 13 point difference from Arauz. Um, you know, there was controversy on, on whether he was supposed to come in second or Yaku Perez. Um, and there was even a tendency to request Lasso to step down from the candidacy for the country's sake, you know. Um, and um, so, so and, and you know, there's also the case that uh, the democratic left and the indigenous bloc later pushed for voting null or submitting an empty ballot in, in the second the second round of voting um brian out of all these things what do you think made lasso win against against so many odds well thank you mateo for those questions and i you know as we were talking a little bit in the the pregame um you know, I, I, you're Ecuadorian, and actually, Ecuador is one of only two countries in the region that I've I've never actually worked in or been to before. So I always always try to make that disclaimer because that you know people people like to give opinions, and I, I I think it's tough to really be a credible analyst on on some of these places if if you've never been there. In in my case with Ecuador. I've been following it very closely, but it's 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 not the same if you've been there on the ground. So please, if I if I stray at all from the you know from the beaten path, I trust you'll you'll keep you'll keep me honest and sort of jump in. And I'd like to hear your opinion on some of these things too. Um, look, I think Ecuador had this this election had outsized importance uh, that kind of surpassed Ecuador's actual size, which of course it's it's not not one of the, the largest countries or the largest economies on the continent. But, you know, this was a barometer where election where, you know, we saw kind of a, a center right candidate in, in Guillermo Lasso, who, you know, was a banker uh, or a businessman who um, had, had run for president, I think twice before and, and, and fallen short, running against this younger figure, Andres Arauz, who was in his thirties, um, it was actually, I think it was a 30 year difference between an age between these two candidates, but Arauz was there very much as kind of a, a, almost a proxy candidate for Rafael Correa, who had been the president during the 2000s. And part of the reason people were watching this is because one of the kind of macro trends happening in Latin American politics right now is this, you know, reaching back into the 2000s. You know, the 2000s were a great period for Latin America. It was, in fact, you could argue the period from roughly 2003 to 2013 was, was probably the best period in the region's modern history. Economically, politically, you know, it was mostly democratic. You had the commodities boom being driven by all this demand from China. You had economies that grew at very vigorous rates. And you also had some 50 million people who came out of poverty and into the middle class. And, and Ecuador was, was a country where one of the countries where this happened and so all across the region i mean in argentina where they they um they last year they they elected not christina kirchner but christina kirchner was the vice president and she had somebody in the in the presidential spot you know that was at least at some effort for a lot of argentines that was an ability to kind of recreate the magic of those years um, and I think similar dynamic clearly in play in Ecuador. And, and by the way, I think there's an element of that in the Brazilian election that we were just talking about. Part of the reason that so many people want Lula back is because they remember those years correctly. They remember those years as being really good years. Um, so, uh, and most of these leaders, you know, is the so-called pink tide of um, kind of a uh, uh, a grab bag, if you will, of kind of flavors along the ideological spectrum on the left, meaning you had kind of center leftist figures during those years like 
Lula who were democratic. And then you had kind of the much harder left um, anti-democratic and dictatorial as represented by Chavez in Venezuela, which is all to say that's kind of the regional context in which this whole Ecuadorian vote happened. Now, as for the specifics on this one, I, I, I like you, Mateo, I mean, I was very surprised that Lasso won. And, you know, you mentioned the result was close, but it actually wasn't that close. It was, you know, Lasso won by five percentage points, which in, you know, today's politics um, is, is a lot. And the concession happened very quickly. What explains a, you know, 60 something year old banker uh, winning in a country where, and here it gets very convoluted, but like basically he was representing a kind of continuity from the Lenin Moreno government in terms of economic policies and a government that was extremely unpopular, the Moreno government, right? Um, I think that the, the easiest answer is that you had that the backlash against Korea and against that sort of brand of politics was stronger than many of us anticipated. And it was strong kind of throughout society, but where it really surprised us was in indigenous um, segments and indigenous movements. And, and here, just to, to kind of conclude, I mean, again, all this stuff, like when you try to explain the details, it can get really complicated. But as you referenced, there were really, there were three main candidates in the first round of this election. And the guy that, that Lasso edged out was this Yaku Perez, um, who's, uh, who represents kind of a new left, right? Like a, a left that has its roots in um, the indigenous movement in the Ecuadorian case that is very quote unquote anti-extractivist, you know, really believes that, that mining needs to be reduced or eliminated um, altogether. Uh, and, you know, they barely missed out on making the second round. And, you know, I think that, that Correa and Arauz made a huge mistake in that once they went to that second round, I watched it happen. Um, they, Correa and Arauz spent all of their energy trying to annihilate Yacu Perez with all the sort of force of like their bloggers and you know, their, and it's kind of this regional network of people who you know, really seemed most focused on destroying Yacu Perez because they saw him as kind of competition in that left of center space. And in doing so, they, you know, maybe they failed to focus on Lasso. And they also, you know, really angered Yacu Perez and his supporters. And as a result, or maybe not as a result, but that sort of informed the decision that Yacu Perez made to tell his supporters to abstain, not to vote in the runoff. And with those people who might have been under other circumstances, like you, you, you know, sort of two different flavors of, you know, left of center politics, they might have been on the issues sort of naturally, like, naturally inclined to vote for Arauz and Correa, but the amount of anger was such that, that you know, it may have cost, it may have cost Arauz and Correa the election. That is, that is very interesting. Um, yeah, certainly it's, it's, it, it was a strategical, I guess, a, a, a bad move, you know, from Arauz and Correa and on the other side, you know, like, as, as you mentioned, there's this, all these bottled up uh, feelings against the, the, the previous government of Correa that, uh, you know, could have played a role, uh, certainly. And so, so my, my, my second question would also be, as you, you mentioned that there were like, you know, like center or center left leaning people who actually abstained because who would have rather vote for, for Correa or, or, or Arauz, but in, and ended up abstaining or voting for Lasso. Um, many of these include young voters, um, women, uh, members of, of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so, so, so my question would be, uh, like, what, of, what, are, what are their concerns? Why, why did they choose Lasso, who represents, you know, a conservative right over Arauz? And if so, uh, how should Lasso, um, after being elected by them as well, 
uh, move to compromise with the voters that put him into office? Let me try to answer the, the second part of that first. I mean, I, I, there is already, I mean, during the runoff process, Lasso um, showed signs of being willing to compromise on some of his key positions in order to win um, in order to win the support, the support of you know kind of segments of society who might not ideologically have been with him, and to kind of make his candidacy more amenable. The challenge he faces is that now that the election's over and the sort of the common enemy is gone, uh, it's going to be really tough for him to govern because he really has very little support in Congress. And not to sound like an old timer, but you know prior to Correa. Ecuador was a country that I don't know the exact math on this, but where it was very common for leaders and presidents to, to suffer sort of popular revolts and army coups and other things. I mean, it was it was a perennially unstable country in a, you know, even, I mean, Latin America sort of has that reputation, but even by Latin American standards, like Ecuador prior to Correa was was very, very unstable. And I, I'm sure you grew up with that and you know, you know what I'm talking about. So um, mm, there's always sort of this question hanging over Ecuador, uh, as well as Bolivia for that matter, which kind of had a similar history prior to Evo Morales, you know, another kind of 2000s era leader that was indirectly not exactly voted back in, but his party was voted back in last year. Um, you know, is are they going to be are they going to be able to hold it together? Is Lasso going to be able to hold it together? As far as you know, the insecurities of the rest of society, that's kind of that's a, that is exactly the kind of question that's hard to address if you're not spending time on the ground or if you're not from a place. I'd be curious to hear your answer to the question that to that part of the question that you asked me. I mean, what what do you what do you think that Lasso was able to tap into as far as that that the insecurities of those groups of society that you mentioned? Wow, that's 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 a good question. Um, certainly, uh, well, it's it's quite interesting. Um, he followed. I don't know. I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, there were three main candidates, as you mentioned. You know, uh, Arauz, Lasso, and then Jaco Perez, who came in a close third against Lasso. But there was also a fourth candidate, and um, a fourth candidate who uh, gathered fourteen percent of the votes in the first round. And he was unknown before the elections. And, uh, you know, through social media, through, through TikTok, he became very viral on, on TikTok and other social media. And he was able to, you know, spread his vision and also connect with the youth, uh, connect with, with other groups of people. Um, Lasso hired this, the campaign manager for, uh, this, for this guy right after the first round. Uh, which I think really helped him, you know, connect with these other groups of people. Um, in his campaigns, although many people can argue that it is very outdated in the way he addresses them, uh, he's also open, you know, to to respect other people's differences. Uh, allegedly, uh, uh, by his, you know, by his speeches, um, many people are also very very worried that he might impose. Uh, that he might not keep his word and, and impose, you know, his, his very conservative vision, not only of what he represents, but what, what he follows. He, he belongs to the Opus Dei, a very conservative um, religious branch. Um, so, so certainly it's, it's more than anything, something to keep an eye out for. Um, but, but, but yeah, like he, I, as, 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 as we discussed, he, he was able to, to connect and gather other votes from people that, you know, Many, including me, wouldn't wouldn't think that he was gonna be able to to get, um, and 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 also you mentioned governability, and I think that's my final my final point, my final question regarding Ecuador, and it's as you said, he has a minority in, in Congress, um, and and interestingly enough, the day after he was elected, the country's risk rate dropped massively, uh, meaning that there was gonna be you know a better opportunity for trade and economic deals for Ecuador in the international community. But at the same time, what does this mean if he has a minority in Congress? Um, and more importantly, um, uh, you know, the country is undergoing a huge healthcare and economic crisis in the last week. 
death rates spiked to over 900% um, due to the pandemic. All these things against him, how can he impose his vision for the country and perhaps prevent this from becoming, you know, a Macri uh, example where, where Macri, the rightist, uh, liberal economist, came in and four years after he left Argentina in one of the greatest crises they've had, uh, and they immediately proceeded to, to elect a, a Fernandez, who, who represents, you know, the left, uh, which is, would be analogous to Correa or Arauz. Um, and, you know, so, so failure of imposing his, this vision for Lasso would most likely mean a, a huge comeback for Correa. Um, how can he circumvent all these odds? Uh, it's not clear he can. And I, I, you know, the comparison that you just made between Macri and Lasso uh, uh, is one that a lot of people are making. And, um, I, you know, Argentina and Ecuador are very different countries. Uh, and, you know, Argentina's problems, uh, thank God for Ecuador, <laughs> um, you know, are, are, are very different and, and, and often sort of seem intractable. Um, Lasso, of, also may have an easier time. I, I don't. I don't know who sort of has the harder task uh, before them. But it's. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's going to be really difficult. And I. Nothing. You know. This is a story that we see repeating itself again and again throughout the region right now. You don't see like the political alignment happening that makes you sort of say, ah, that's going to like sort of establish the path that gets us out of this crisis. It, 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 a lot of these places, Argentina is one of them, um, uh, Colombia is one of them, Chile is one of them. There's just so much, you know, this is, and this is where I think it is fair to use the term polarization and kind of with the negative connotation. It's, it's, there's no, there's no consensus around sort of the basic steps necessary to, to get us out of this really terrible situation because, you know, kind of looking at the region as a whole, it's true that Latin America was ground zero for the pandemic in terms of both its health and its economic effects. And people are now talking about the 2020s being potentially a lost decade for Latin America. But the truth is the 2010s were kind of a lost decade too. Like it was, it was a crappy decade. It was, it was actually, it was the region in the world that grew the least um, in the uh, Latin America was in the 2010s. And so we're, we're talking about really, you know, since 2013, 2014, when um, the, you know, the Brazilian story took a turn for the worse and Venezuela took a way more dramatic turn for the worse. And, you know, Argentina started its sort of um, tailspin that you referenced uh, under Macri, um, you know, things are bad and, and the political consensus is just not there. We don't see, and I, I've said this publicly and it's, it gets me in trouble every once in a while when I say it, but I, I really do believe it's true. I, this, is, this is the lowest quality group of Latin American presidents that we've had since I've been following the region 20 years ago, kind of regardless of your ideological predilection, whether you like somebody you know, who's sort of center left, center or center right, um, there's just not that many. And there are a couple of leaders that are okay, but like there's not anybody who just makes you go like, wow, like that's an example of a country that in tough times is kind of putting things together and, and taking things forward. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I think that consensus is going to, my sense is it's going to continue to be elusive in Ecuador and, and in some other countries as well. And that's one reason why, you know, the, the, um, the World Bank, for example, has said that they don't expect Latin American economies to recover on a per capita basis to where they were back before the pandemic started until 2025. And that's, that's later than any other region in the world. Wow, yeah, I, I did not know. I mean, I sorry that. to be a drag, <laughs> you know? And, you know, the, th the thing is, and the irony of this is like, Latin America is cyclical. It's always had ups and downs. And I keep trying to like, you know, like remind myself of that as I, you know, as I talk and write and kind of do all the things I do. But it's just, it's really hard to see right now where that cyclical recovery kind of that takes things back in a positive direction, where it's going to come from. Certainly. And there's a pendulum to watch out for. Um, you know, it's always, always, always uh, keeping us, you know, active and, and and wondering where, where it's going to go.
Um, and, and, and speaking of that, just for, for a final, for, for some final, um, you know, a, a quick topic, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to Patrick. And uh, yeah, we can, you know, briefly discuss about, about another country that is going into a very worrying uh, time period, uh, Peru. So thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, great. I, I, I wish we could have kind of a panel to discuss each of these case studies because they're obviously so, um, you know, rich in, in debate that we need to have. Um, but at least, you know, just to give a, a little bit of, of uh, attention to Peru, given its, its kind of centrality, uh, you know, in June, I think are the final elections, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, you know, you kind of have Castillo and Fujimori apparently is, is, is kind of going to be the final running. And it's, it's extremely interesting kind of what they represent and what's going to happen in June could potentially be an indicator of what happens in the rest of Latin America. Um, now, concerning the Peruvian case, you know, the stressors imposed by the pandemic have led to strife throughout all of Peru. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been particularly hit. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a rather salient case uh, in, in the study of the pandemic in Latin America. Um, and yeah, those stressors have also made it more difficult than ever for political parties to fulfill their promises and satiate the needs of their constituents. Um, and due to this phenomenon, outsider politics have arisen in Peru and in other parts of Latin America to cha challenge conventional mainstream political parties. Um, which, you know, happens often, but I guess now, you know, looking at the pandemic is you can see, see it as a direct consequence. Now, moving to candidate profiles um, and talking about Pedro Castillo, being a school teacher that attained prominence as a leading figure in the 2017 teacher strike in Peru, what does Castillo's candidacy say about the changing image of the typical presidential candidate in Peru? Um, and how does, his, how does his story fit into the outsider politics narrative, if, if at all? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, Castillo is like, has, you know, came rocketing out of nowhere in this election. Uh, and one just kind of funny story at America's Quarterly, we, we put together these election guides where we kind of do these little thumbnail profiles of each candidate. And they're very kind of brief and to the point. And over the course of the Peruvian race, we decided, you know, we always kind of establish a threshold for when we're going to profile a candidate or not. Because in these elections where there's like 10, 20 candidates, like we just, we can't, I mean, we, we don't have enough people, like we have to draw the line somewhere. And and so in the Peruvian race, we decided to um, draw that at, we, I think this is the same threshold we use elsewhere, but at the 5% support level. So any candidate who's above 5% at some point in the race, we profiled. So we, we profiled eight candidates in this race. Castillo was the ninth. Castillo came rocketing out of nowhere during literally the last like two weeks of the campaign and ended up in the runoff. And I mentioned that because he is like the classic blow it all up candidate. Um, that's why people voted for him was because he's an outsider. But also, I mean, more than that, uh, this, is, this is a guy who, you know, has been very critical of kind of the Peruvian economic model of the last um, 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, he, he has, um, his party said that he was going to nationalize key industries. Now he's sort of backed away from that and said that that's not what he intends to do. I mean, a little broader context on Peru, like he, he you know, it's a fascinating story because over the last 15, 20 years, you could actually make a case that Peru has been, um, at least among the big countries, Latin America's biggest economic success story. Um, it had the fastest GDP growth. It also, critically in my mind, it, it was the country that had some of the biggest declines, if not the biggest declines in poverty um, and inequality also got better, um, which was unusual during that period. Um, but the politics were always a mess. And, you know, as we got into 2020, it was tragically the country. That, so just to pause for a second, that has been kind of the framework that a lot of people, particularly in the United States and particularly here in New York, have looked at Peru and they'd be like, oh my God, like, how can they do that? Peru's been like the greatest success story and they're not wrong, but what they're missing in some cases is that um, the pandemic was especially cruel with Peru. And there's a reason why, um, or there's many reasons why we think that that was the case. It was the country that on a per capita basis had the most deaths from COVID, not only in Latin America, but possibly in the world. Uh, some of the numbers, you know, you can't take those things as if they're, these numbers as if they're gospel, but 
it, it's very clear that in Peru, uh, the, the devastation was terrible. And it also had one of the world's deepest economic recessions as a result, because they did a very, in part, because they did a very, very strict lockdown that didn't work, um, that didn't, didn't, didn't work. And part of the reason why was because even as Peru made all this progress over the last 15, 20 years, they did not really build out the Peruvian state and particularly the healthcare system, but also the banking system, the school system, kind of other, you know, kind of state capacity, what some people call that, was just not there, even compared to places like Brazil. Um, so for example, when Peru tried to pass an aid program uh, and try to try to sort of help out people so that they could stay at home. What they discovered was they weren't able to get money to a lot of these people because they didn't they didn't have um, they weren't part of the formal economy. The the Peruvian government just didn't know how to get to them. So you could almost think of COVID nineteen as being sort of like this heat seeking missile that was perfectly designed to reveal the shortcomings of that Peruvian model of the last fifteen to twenty years. Um, and then, you know, these elections maybe, maybe, I, I don't know, maybe had the, you could say the, the misfortune of being timed just as, uh, you know, Peru was expected. And I think to some extent it still is expected to have a very vigorous economic recovery this year um, from that huge kind of dive that they took in 2020, but uh, it's not enough it's not enough to get them back to where they were before. And people were and still not are not feeling that recovery in a way that eased their anger. So all that adds up to a very angry populace that voted for um, one candidate, Castillo, who very anti-establishment, um, perhaps anti-democratic, uh, and, and then another candidate in Keiko Fujimori, whose democratic credentials are just as dubious, if not more so than Castillo's, and who kind of represents a different phenomenon. So a lot of people now in Peru are like, God, who do I vote for? Yeah, um, and that's actually kind of uh, something that segues into the next question, which has to do with, um, yeah, that whole controversy on, on the, I think the, the filing by Peru Libre to, to, to kind of nationalize certain key industries. Um, you know, that has obviously created a bit of unrest, especially in rural areas that rely on you know, the, the, the copper mining industry, for example, um, which, which I think was specifically mentioned in the filing, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, how do you think that Castillo could potentially real, I guess, get back from that? Do you think he'll be able to rally enough support and I guess appeal to rural populations who feel um, maybe excluded and I guess afraid of his political ideology to a certain extent? I mean, Castillo's leading in the polls right now. Um, he, he, at present, it looks like he might win. And actually a lot of his support has come from these rural areas. It's kind of this rural, um, very indigenous, uh, you know, part of Peru that, that he, you know, that he represents. And, you know, as far as what he's going to do, I mean, I, it's amazing to kind of be here again and Latin American politics so often, uh, politics in general, but particularly Latin American politics, uh, you know, so much depends on like what one person does. And like, who is, who is this person? What do they believe? What are their plans? Um, those questions end up making, you know, really determining kind of the fate of nations, right? Like is Castillo, if he's elected, is he gonna be more, especially after the comments that he made this week, trying to distance himself from, you know, what he describes as his more radical base. Is he telling the truth? Is he like a Lula figure where he's like, no, 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 I've changed. Like, I, I swear I'll, you know, I'm not going to blow everything up. Or is he more like a Chavez who, you know, Chavez also swore up and down at various points over the years, particularly early in his presidency, that he was a, a Democrat and a moderate and that he didn't want to expropriate and kind of all these things. And, and then he ended up doing what he did. And, you know, sometimes even even these people in their in their heart of hearts, they don't they don't know what they're going to do, and it depends on circumstances and kind of how things go. So, um, you know, I, I often say that kind of one of the lines I maybe use too much is that to really follow Latin American politics, you, you're it's better to have a psychoanalyst than a political analyst um, because so much of it depends on trying to like understand like these these individuals who and 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 what they're going to do. Right. Yeah, I guess um, I'll definitely be that 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 uh, phrase will definitely be sticking with me for a while. <laughs> um, 
So that said, obviously there, there's so much more we could discuss about Peru, uh, but I do want to turn to the Q&A because I see that we have some questions there and that we are a bit over time. Um, there is kind of one interesting one that says, are the protests of 20, I mean, both of them are very interesting, but uh, kind of looking at what we haven't discussed. Um, are the protests of 2019 a sign of strong democratic participation or could they pose a threat to democratic institutions? Um, I guess that's a, a pretty interesting perspective to, to look at. That is, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, that's a short question, but there's sort of a lot, a lot in that question. Um, you know, well, for those who, who uh, I mean, I, I know that everybody here kind of follows the region, but in late 2019, October 2019, we had these huge protests break out in Chile and Ecuador, kind of um, Bolivia as well, and uh, Colombia um, also. And, you know, they kind of went away because of the pandemic. And it faded a little bit before that, but it, it was, you know, the pandemic kind of, and the obvious inability to kind of be out there on the street uh, chased a lot of people off. And one of the questions that's kind of hanging over everything right now is, is that just like a, a fire that's getting ready to kind of, you know, flare back up again once, once the pandemic, it's not, not that it's over, but once people are kind of able to be back out on the streets. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, as far as whether it's, uh, a threat to democracy or not? I think it depends on the country. I would say no in most cases. I'm, I'm sort of thinking case by case. Like in the Chilean case, which was kind of the most dramatic and the one that people still talk about the most, I actually think Chile showed its maturity and ended up channeling the energy from those protests into a, a, a constitutional convention that's going to produce a new charter. Um, it's going to be written under democracy as opposed to the one that was written under the Pinochet dictatorship back in 1980. And I, you know, I obviously think that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, I would prefer at least for now to, you know, I, I mean, I think, look, in the Chilean case, there were, there were, were there people who were involved in those protests who were anti-democratic? Yeah. <laughs> but, but not the majority. I mean, you had, you know, you had 1.3 million people in the streets. I think these were people who were mostly responding to what they saw as the shortcomings of their government and exercising their democratic right to protest. So if anything, I think that most of these protests were a celebration of democracy rather than a, a threat to it. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's brilliant. I, I think that's, that's very well put. I, I often talk about the Chilean case as well, just because of how, you know, how peculiar it is and how one could directly tie that to the constitutional amendments that, you know, the delegates that will be chosen, I guess, this year, which is also one of, I guess, the democratic participations that we're looking at. Um, I think that that uh, marks the amount of time that we have, unfortunately. Um, I guess I'll let uh, Madeo give give the official conclusion, but Brian, it's it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, and it was a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, once once again, on behalf of LAC and of myself, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. for coming to our speaker series and just you know providing so much context and just you know like like a, a very very well thought uh, um, put out analysis uh, of, of you know what what the region is undergoing with a pandemic with elections what this might mean for the future um how the past connects to this i think it, it was very 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 clear for everyone so thank you very much um i also want to thank our e-board um who just put a lot of work into the research into the outreach uh, for this um, and the design and development of this project and the speaker series. So thank you so much. And to our audience as well, thank you for, for tuning in and for always uh, being there with us. Um, we understand there are many topics we could not get to. Therefore, if you would like to continue the conversation with Brian, uh, please refer to our Facebook page uh, at Tuft Slack or his social media handles like uh, his Twitter at Bra Brazil Brian. Um, or if you want to learn more about our organization or upcoming events, we'll also post a follow up to this meeting with information about it. So keep tuned. Again, uh, thank you very much for your attendance and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Right. Bye. Thank you, Brian.